Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Focus. It is Wednesday, February the 8th, 2023, at 12.01 p.m. Central Time. Today's focus, 11,000 people dead. Today's focus, 11,000 people dead. And even though 11,000 people have died in a great tragedy, if you look around, it seems Christians are more concerned and bothered by Sam Smith and Kim Petras' performance at the Grammys. Seems like our politicians want to act like children during the State of the Union address and scream and yell things out like, I don't know, they're on a playground somewhere. So while, and, and I've looked at a lot of Christian websites, and I'm like, okay, oh, we're still upset about Andy Stanley. We're upset about Sam Smith. Uh, everyone has an opinion about the State of the Union. Uh, everyone, it's all like there's all these other things in the meantime. According to one news source, if I just read the actual headline here, hope fading as deaths in Turkey, Syria pass 11,000. Hope fading as deaths in Turkey and Syria pass 11,000. They don't have the word and in the, uh, the headline, but hope is fading as over 11,000 people have died in Turkey and Syria because of an earthquake. 11,000 people who were alive are now gone. They are dead. And I don't know about you, that raises some serious questions. But if you, maybe just hearing the number 11,000, maybe that doesn't impact you. Maybe you're like, it's just a number, 11,000. Maybe you kind of shrug your shoulders. Maybe you're like, ah, oh, that's horrible. And then you just kind of move on. And I understand that. What if maybe we make it a little bit more real? Well, well, what if we make it a little bit more real? It's a race against time to get to people trapped in earthquake debris in southern Turkey and Syria. Two large quakes and scores of aftershocks are blamed for more than 5,000 deaths. And cold weather is complicating the fight for survival. Here's CBS's Chris Livesey. A trapped woman's faint, blood-curdling scream might be the only thing to escape. We heard them, cries a survivor named Denise. They're calling out for help, but how can we? Nobody has come. When the help finally arrives, it can be too late. It's a battle against both time... Hearing a woman... Screaming like that, I don't know. That 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 makes it more real. That goes beyond a number on a page. Eleven thousand. But hearing a woman trapped screaming, screaming for help, and no one can get to them. No one can help them. And by the time they get to them, in many cases, it's too late. The people screaming for help have died. In fact, over 11,000 people have died. At that that report was late last night. That was the number was at 5,000. Now as of uh, an hour ago, according to the the news report that I have in front of me, over 11,000 people have died. Now I know, I understand. So I I do not want to in any way shape or form try to deny the reality of our lives. Tragedy happens all around us and I understand that there's some there has to be some way that we process the tragedy, but we move on with our lives. It's not like that at every tragedy, we can just stop our lives. And, and I, I understand we have to move on. So I understand that while this is a hor- horrific, horrible tragedy, people are going to go on with their other lives and be focused on this and focused on that. Doesn't mean they don't care about this. It just means sometimes when you're kind of looking like, wait a minute, 11,000 people are dead and Christians are screaming about all of these other things. I'm not in any way trying to apply. They don't care about this. It just seems that that's where the focus has been. And it's just kind of been a startling contrast in my mind. But here is my struggle. And I know in a Christian podcast, I'm not supposed to say 
some of the things I'm going to say. I know that there is a a right way to respond to this, according to most Christians, but I, I want to approach this in a far more realistic way. So here's how I'm going to approach it. I heard about the earthquake. I immediately started checking all of my podcast feeds, making sure I had the right podcast subscribed to so I could get you know, up-to-date information about this horrible tragedy. And as I kept listening to one podcast, the numbers kept going up. Hundreds, thousands, 5,000, now over 11,000. And as I've been watching this horrible tragedy unfold, I cannot help myself but to first think of these words. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him, that's of God, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, that's of God, and this is speaking of God, God worketh all things, all things, after the counsel of his own will. God works all things according to the counsel of his good will. I could state it another way, quoting from the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 3. The London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, it states this, God hath decreed in himself from all eternity, By the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Let me read this. Very, very famous theological confession of faith. Here we go. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Whatever comes to pass, it's been decreed by God. He works all things according to his will and pleasure. He works all things according to his will and pleasure, not my will, his will. Now, those are theological statements. We can refer to them as theological truths. And I hold to those truths. I believe God is an all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God. He knows the beginning from the end. I believe he, I believe he knew that an earthquake would strike. I, knew, I, I believe he not only knew what was going to happen, he decreed what was going to happen because he works all things according to his good pleasure and will. I know that he has the power to intervene at any point in time. But I also know this sad reality that 11,000 people plus have died. I also know that many of those in the rubble were screaming out for help, crying out. You could hear their screams and nobody could get to them. Nobody could help them. And then when they finally get to them, they're dead. And nobody was coming to raise the dead. Nobody was coming to heal them. Nobody's going to be there to replace arms or legs that have to be amputated because of crush and injuries. All of the charismatics are not going to show up. They're going to talk their, you know, they're going to talk their big game from the safety of their sanctuary or TV studios or podcast studios while these people suffer and die. And then that headline is just basically all hope. Is, is, is vanishing. All hope is, is fading. All hope is going away because by every hour that passes, those who are trapped under the rubble will slowly and painfully and horribly die. There is nothing pleasant about it. There is nothing great about it. There's, no, there's, not, there's nothing wonderful about it. It's a horrific, horrific thi- thing. It's a horrific, horrific event. It's a horrific, horrific reality.
Now, I know for today's focus, we've, we've been working on another topic, and I will get back to that topic, but I knew today I had to at least begin today's live broadcasting. Whatever other broadcasts we do today, what other things we talk about today, I had to start with this because I, I struggle. Now, I'm not, I'm not even yet saying what I struggle with, but I think you get the idea. I think you can, you should be able to feel the tension, right? You should be able to yourself going, oh, man. You see, God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. He works all things according to his good pleasure and will. Yet 11,000 people, 11,000 people plus have died, and others are trapped screaming out for help, and they're going to slowly and surely die. How do I reconcile a God who is all-powerful, who could intervene but doesn't intervene? How do I reconcile a God who knew what was going to happen and did nothing to stop it happening? How do I reconcile that? How does your faith reconcile that? Now, some Christians, their attempt is to say, God had nothing to do with it. God, you know, God couldn't do anything. Like they they almost want to somehow eliminate any connection from God to this horrific or tragic event. Some people will try to say it was Satan. But then you're like, well, wait a minute. God created Satan and God knew what Satan was going to do. So that still doesn't really work. So or you have to try to say God doesn't know. Like there's a lot of attempts within Christian history to try to explain this stuff. And typically it either destroys God, it makes God less than God, or it elevates Satan above God, or or like it just becomes a mess theologically. The reality is God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is sovereign. God knows the beginning from the end. God works all things according to his good pleasure and will, yet horrible, 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 horrible things happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I'm by no means diminishing the suffering that happens on a smaller scale. But when something reaches this scale, 11,000 plus dead, and you have the audio of the people screaming out for help and no help is coming. Whew, that, that makes it even more real. And I, I, I dealt with a little bit of this on Sunday with struggling with Hebrews chapter 11, trying to explain how there are these situations where I don't understand it, but I have to believe by faith. There, there, that, that faith has to give me to something that I cannot see and I don't understand because I don't understand and it's difficult for me to wrap my mind around. I'll, I'll give you an example. I went to one Christian website. Most of the Christian websites, it was Andy Stanley, State of the Union, and Sam Smith and Kim Petras from the Grammys. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. How many articles can be written about these things? Okay, right. But then I went to one uh, Christian website, and I at least was pleased that the very first thing I saw was about the, the, the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And I was like, well, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for at least acknowledging this horrible loss of human life. And if we believe all life is you know, sacred, if we, if we believe there's a sanctity, I should say, to, to human life, that because all people who die are created in the image of God, then this should bother us, and it should bother us greatly. But on that website, they had a prayer all typed out that you could pray. And I found myself struggling. Now, I know I'm not supposed to say these things, but I tried to, I try to wrap my mind around this very difficult reality. And I know many Christians, when I say these things, they become, they get very defensive and almost like it's an attack upon them personal. Uh, personally, it's not a personal attack. It's just the reality of what we see and that there are many, many, many millions of people who have these difficult questions that the church sometimes becomes, the church is too uncomfortable or they feel that it makes them so uncomfortable they're not willing to deal with it. And let me explain. So here's a prayer that I'm supposed to pray to God about the earthquake in Turkey. But I try to wrap my mind around it because you want me now to pray to the God who knew it was going to happen. You want me to pray to the God who works all things according to his good pleasure and will. You want me to pray to the God who did nothing to stop it. You want me to pray to the God who's doing nothing to intervene in it. So what am I supposed to pray to God for? Now that he helps the victims? 
Now that he helps those who serve, like, how do I, how do I wrap my mind around praying to the God who did nothing to stop it, who did nothing to prevent it, who knew it was going to happen? And if we truly understand the sovereignty of God and his eternal decrees, it's a part of his eternal decree. Or you have to say God is so far removed from it that he can't intervene. He can't do anything. Then what's the point of praying in that case? Now, I do believe we're supposed to pray. I, I don't, by no means do you, don't, don't, I don't want you to think I'm throwing out prayer. I'm trying to deal with the, the reality of the complexity of having faith in the face of a tragedy, and we have faith in a God who could stop the tragedy. We have faith in a God who knew about the tragedy. We have a fa- faith in a God who decreed the tragedy. And if I remove any of that about God, well, then there's no real reason going to God for anything in the first place. He doesn't know what's going to happen, can't stop what's going to happen. I mean, that, like then that, that, that doesn't really matter. Then at that point, that destroys it from a different perspective. And I don't have any good answers. I know God gives and God taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, a kind of concept, right? That Job had to deal with. I know we live in a fallen world. And as a result, the, the whole of creation groans under the curse. All of creation groans under the curse. I do know, theologically, and this is hard to say, but if we believe in human depravity, then we believe none of us deserve to even breathe another breath. We all deserve death and judgment. I do understand that. That no, that you can't say good people died because there are none that are good. No, not one. That still, logically speaking, none of us deserve to live. I I do understand that, theologically speaking. Don't know if that makes it easier for me to process over 11,000 people dying. But I do understand at least that theological concept. So I guess here's the question. And and, and, And this is a sincere question. Please don't think that this is a trying to make, you know, I know sometimes a pastor or a Christian podcaster can ask a question, but they're really asking a question in order to try to make a point or to try to set someone up. That That's not what this is. How do you pray? When tragedy strikes, understanding the God you're praying to is the God who did not intervene, who did not stop it, who knew it was going to happen, and depending on your theology, even decreed it to happen. So how do you pray, try, try, how do you pray reconciling those, that, that, like, I'm supposed to pray, but reconciling it with these other facts? You've got the tragedy, you've got, I, I'm called to pray without ceasing, I'm called to pray. When I pray, I know that prayer is talked about in scripture and we're called to do so, right? I understand that. So I've got the tragedy, I've got the prayer, but then I have these facts about the God I'm praying to. How do you, like in your mind, do you try to reconcile that or, or you just don't care about reconciling it? And then what, what do you pray? Like what, what should we pray? Now, I know what I should do is I should have turned on the microphone. I said, ladies and gentlemen, for today's focus, we're going to pause what we've been studying. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time praying for the victims. Uh, We're going to pray for the tragedy in Turkey and Syria. We're going to pray for the survivors. We're going to pray for the family members of those who lost loved ones. We're going to pray for God's comfort, for God's peace. We're going to pray for the, the, the those trying to rescue them. And, and, and we would just kind of offer a general prayer. And everyone would be like, amen, praise God. That was wonderful. And everybody would be happy with it. 
I know that's what I'm supposed to do. But the problem with that is it almost denies this real complexity in the midst of the tragedy. And while we may not, within the Christian world, we, want, may, we may not want to acknowledge it, we may not want to deal with it, there are those sitting in the pew who are going to be like, well, wait, we're going to pray to the God who didn't do anything to stop it? It makes no sense. There are those outside of the church going, wait a minute, that makes no sense. That makes no sense. I, I, on Sunday, I mentioned this. There, there was an article um, I think it's, it was on the Medium app, uh, which I subscribe to, where uh, basically people can write articles and you subscribe to get access to all of them. And so this person had written an article about a pastor who in the church was attacked by someone with a hammer, like during the church service. Like someone came into the service with a hammer, ran up there and started beating the pastor with the hammer. And so the the author of this article was kind of like, it was the response of everyone that was bizarre to him because they were like, pray for the pastor, pray for, you know, and, and he was like, you're going to pray to the God who didn't do anything to stop it. You're, you're going to pray to the God who allowed it. That seems odd. Hey, God, you know, the pastor that you just let get beat down with a hammer, or the, you know, the, the, the whole situation that you let happen. Hey, we need you now to comfort. We now need you to bring peace. It, it's not like, hey, God, why didn't you stop it? And he was perplexed by that. And while many Christians were like, you just don't have faith and just attack the guy, I was kind of like, well, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think those are reasonable questions. When I hear a woman trapped under rubble of an earthquake screaming, how do you... Re- how- How do you handle that? I mean, you could say, God, please let her be rescued. But even if you get her, re- if you pray for her to be rescued, what about the other 10,999 who weren't? They died. They say, well, at least one was saved. Uh, I, I, I guess maybe you could look at it that way. And why, why would God intervene to save that one and not the other 10,999 or whatever the exact, exact number was? Obviously, I don't know her exact number, obviously, but you get the idea. Over 11,000 have died, so she's a part, and, and they at least implied that by the time they got to whoever, by the time they got to someone, you could hear the person crying that it was too late. They said it was too late. I don't know if they were referring to the woman who was screaming, but someone they got to was was not alive. That they that person was not rescued. And see, while this is happening, there'll be entire denominations running around on, you know, on Sunday saying, you know, God heals, God heals, God heals, God heals. And yet all of these people are dying and suffering and, and well. Does Christianity at times feel like we live in denial of reality? Christians make claims that now that you're a Christian, you supposedly can say no to sin and yes to God, but at the same time still try to acknowledge we can't be perfect, which would not make any sense. It seems like Christians almost sometimes want to deny the reality that we still have a sinful nature and we still sin. There are those who who want to constantly claim healing is guaranteed for here and now, but deny the reality of death, pain, and suffering, death, pain, and suffering. Even if they say, hey, God's going to raise this little girl from the dead named Olive. We're going to have resurrection, basically, worship services, and the girl's not resurrected. They just move on, still making the same claims that healing is guaranteed. A denial of reality. Christianity should not lead to the denial of reality. Christianity must embrace 
reality, but to do so with our faith intact. It's almost like for some people, faith is the denial of reality. Faith has to be something we hold to in the midst of reality. It doesn't cause us to deny it. It means we're clinging to this faith in the midst of things. Because remember, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It's, it's the, I'm going to read it directly. I don't want to misquote it. Because, uh, because I've read it from too many different translations recently, so I will merge all the different translations together and it'll turn into something it shouldn't. Hebrews chapter 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, we, we acknowledge what we do see. We have to deal with it, but at the same time, we hold on to something that we can't see, that we don't. And sometimes the two are in direct... Co- conflict with one another and we have to it doesn't mean we do. some people when they say well see faith sees what we you know grabs onto what we don't see but that doesn't mean at the expense of reality it means that we i face the reality head on i do not deny it job did not deny the pain and the suffering and the reality around him he didn't blame it on satan he he understood it god gives God takes away. He understood that what had happened what came from the hands of God. He understood God was involved. He, he expressed his pain and suffering with the reality. He didn't deny it. He didn't cover it up. He wasn't using all the Christian cliches that we come up with. No, he was like, I wish I was never born. I wish I was dead. He was willing. He, he, he held on to faith. But he acknowledged the reality. And somehow faith and reality have to, they have to coexist. Faith doesn't mean I, I deny reality or change reality or pretend that it's not there. It's like, no, I understand. 11,000 people have died. Over 11,000 people have died in an earthquake. And that God, the God that I hold faith into, the God that I'm clinging to, the God I will pray to, is the God who knew this was going to happen before the foundations of the world. He is a God who has the power to have intervened at any time, but did not. He is a God who's sovereign, who decrees all things to come to pass according to his will. So somehow this is a part of his will and I don't understand it. I don't like it. It bothers me. It's hor- I don't understand Police officers beating a man to death. I don't understand it. I, other than sinful nature, I understand it from that perspective. I don't understand that today, as I speak, there are young children being physically abused. There are young children being sexually abused. Many times that happens inside the church. A lot of times. That's what I've often said. Genesis 1-1 is the most difficult verse for me. In the beginning, God created. I'm like, whoa, 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 God, God, God. No, 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 no. Because I know what happens after he creates. I live in this world. I'm like, why would you create a world where this is going to happen? Now, some people say, well, God didn't intend it to happen. Well, then are you saying he didn't know it was going to happen? And even if he didn't know it, once it happened, are you saying he was incapable of stopping it? Well, then you destroy his knowledge and you destroy his power. We, we Christians cannot create a system where we seem to indicate to the world that we are, we've lost touch with reality. We have to let the world know that we understand the complexities of this. I think I think the culture has started to become very 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 upset, almost angry with Christians almost denial of reality. I think we've seen this with school shootings. I really do. I really do. I think the culture is tired of Christians saying, you know, you know, prayers 
prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. And, and, they, and the world will say, your thoughts and prayers have not stopped one school shooting. <laughs> thoughts and prayers. The kids are already dead. Hey, thoughts and prayers for the people in Turkey. What? For, they're, they're, thoughts and prayers. What, 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 like what? So I can understand the world's becoming very antagonistic towards those, those things. I think the world now is far more willing to go, no, 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 no. I'm sick and tired of you saying that. What we have to be able to say to them is we, I understand, we struggle with this same thing. I struggle with it. What we're saying is that somehow faith and reality have to coexist. They have to merge together in a way that we can embrace both. And I'm sorry, I'm hitting the microphone. And I don't have any easy answers for anybody. And if you're looking to me for answers, I'm just trying to be a voice of someone going, we've got to talk about this. And I know there'll be other Christian podcasts will have their three points and a simple answer. And like, you know, all things work to good. And and it's just, you know, all the typical talking points. But at some point, the talking points don't work. As a Christian, I have placed my faith in a God who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who is sovereign, who has decreed the end from the beginning, and all things work according to his counsel, his pleasure. And I don't understand why he does what he does. I don't understand his thoughts. I don't understand his ways. It makes no sense to me. I will fully admit that and acknowledge that. I wonder... What if our prayers after tragedy was more of, Lord, 11,000 people are dead in Turkey and Syria because of an earthquake. Lord, you chose not to intervene. You chose not to stop it. There are people currently trapped, slowly dying, And it appears they will die. I don't understand. I don't understand why. And I struggle with confusion, with hurt, with pain. At the same time, I confess that you're holy, you're righteous, you're good, and you're loving because your word declares that to be true of you. Lord, I do place the pain and suffering before you and understanding you will work things according to your will and pleasure. And I don't always understand your will. And if I'm honest, Lord, I don't, some, I don't often agree with your will. Forgive me for at times wanting to be God. I will cling to what is true about you and be honest with the confusion that I often feel about you. And in Jesus' name, I pray. That is today's focus for Wednesday, February the 8th, 2023.